When two bodies are not on a collision course, how do we enforce one? Proportional navigation is a law that attempts this. It's implemented as part of a process known as the homing loop, and it's the basis of many modern missile guidance laws. Therefore, understanding PRONAV is fundamental to understanding missile guidance. But the literature on the topic is vast and very deep. There are papers on theory, different forms of proportional navigation, and which ones are actually best. Let's start simple and look at the qualities of PRONAV, or I should say, what are not some of the qualities. Welcome to Section 2, Module 1. Here's a target with a given heading and a pursuer with a given lead angle. Assume these bodies do not maneuver. Will they collide? Well, it seems obvious they won't, but let's set them in motion. Note the rotation of the line of sight direction and therefore the non-zero line of sight rate. And recall from section one that a collision triangle is obtained when the line of sight angle lambda is constant in time. Now, obviously this isn't happening here. So what should the pursuer do with its velocity vector? Right. It should steer to our left, that is, rotate its velocity vector clockwise to achieve the correct lead angle for collision. Okay, so how should we quantify the rotation of the velocity vector? And what variable will we use to cue its rotation? Now the concept we're working with here is to rotate the pursuer velocity vector in response to the line of sight angle change. The pursuer velocity vector angle with respect to the horizon is called the fly path angle. And the fly path angle rate and line of sight rate are positive clockwise. Based on this concept, let's propose that the time rate of change of the flight path angle should be in response to the rate of change of the line of sight angle. Then if we're on a collision course or lambda dot is zero, the flight path angle doesn't change. And if we're not on a collision course, then given the sign conventions for gamma dot and lambda dot and the gain n, which we choose, the flight path angle will change in a way that is consistent with achieving a collision triangle. At this point, you should verify for yourself that this makes sense. I recommend taking a moment to conjure up a thought experiment or two to form your own opinion on whether or not this proposed law should work. Well, now let's see what this does geometrically. Now to get there, I'm going to do a first order discretization of the proposed law so we can work this in an iterative fashion as we have up to this point. So gamma dot is just d gamma dt, or approximately delta gamma over delta t, which is approximately n times delta lambda over delta t. And then the delta just refers to, for example, uh, for flight path angle, the difference between flight path angle at any two adjacent points in time. For example, ti and ti plus 1. Then we're going to let delta t be one second so that the approximation simplifies. Delta gamma is n times delta lambda. And then solving for the desired flight path angle at a future point in time, uh, we see it depends on the current flight path angle and the line of sight angle current and at that future point in time as well. And we can use this now to iterate through uh, a few different scenarios and observe uh, what this law produces. Now back to our original initial conditions, which were clearly not a collision course. We're going to implement the law for n equals 1. So initializing at t naught, we have the following values for line of sight and flight path angle. Now to compute gamma i plus 1, to go into the next iteration, we need lambda i plus 1, as we already have lambda and gamma at the current time t naught instant. 
We'll note that over the time interval, the value of gamma naught is held constant as the desired flight path angle. And we don't get an update to that flight path angle until the time interval at T1 begins. So from the diagram, immediately we can see that the tip of the velocity vectors show the positions of the bodies at time Ti plus 1. That is the future range vector at time Ti plus 1. Now from that range vector, simply taking the inverse tangent of its component values, we have the lead angle at Ti plus 1. And so now we can repeat. And again, and again, take a moment to observe the outcome. Does this lead to a collision? Well, it's hard to tell. We see the pursuer closing the distance with the target. But note that at time t6, the pursuer is slightly behind the target. Uh, the engagement appears to turn into a tail chase. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening here. And it occurs for this choice of n equal to 1. So only if the pursuer has a velocity advantage over the target will collision occur for a tail chase scenario. Does this law achieve a collision triangle? Well, no, it does not. We know this because the flight path angle, and also the lead angle, therefore, is changing continuously. Now, this may not be fully unexpected because a gain of n equals 1 means that for any degree change in the line of sight, we get an equal degree change in the flight path angle. So this guidance law is known as pursuit guidance. And in pursuit guidance, there is no lead of the target. Lead of the target, of course, is key to getting a collision triangle. Hence, again, there is no collision triangle. Let's set n equal to 3. And then we have our same initial conditions, and we'll proceed as before. So at time t1, because we have n equal to 3, we get 3 times the change in the flight path angle. Notice the big difference between i equals 0 and i equals 1 in that flight path angle. As we just progress to now i equals 2, that change in flight path angle actually decreased. And as we go to i equals 3, the change was even less. And on the fourth time step, it doesn't change. And it doesn't change. And it continues on that way. Does the law achieve a collision? Does this law achieve a collision triangle? Absolutely. There it is. At time t3, lambda is constant thereafter. Hence, we are on a collision triangle. And at a future point in time, collision will occur. Let's increase the gain. Here's n equals 5. Same setup. Of course, now on the first time step, the flight path angle changes five times the delta lambda value, as opposed to the previous example, which is just three times. So the largest yet course correction. On the second iteration, we have 78 degrees line of sight, and it stays that way thereafter. So we achieve a collision triangle, the bodies will collide, and apparently the difference is that we achieve one faster with this larger navigation gain. Here's a summary of the numerical results for our three examples. For n equals 1, it was a pursuit guidance course, and that's reflected in the continuously changing light of sight angle. There was no collision triangle, it was a tail chase. Only if the pursuer could go faster than the target was there a collision. 
when n equaled 3, there was a collision triangle because the response of the pursuer was to lead the target more. And for n equals 5, again, the same result. But comparing 3 to 5, we see that we achieve the collision triangle faster for greater navigation gain. Although, note the difference between the zero and first iteration for each of these n cases. The larger the gain, the greater the initial amount of control effort or the initial maneuver effort that has to be employed by the pursuer. So although we are obtaining a collision course faster as the gain increases, we have to put more effort into it. But once that course is achieved, then you have the course and no more control effort is put in. So at this point for us, it's an open question on which gain may lead to the least amount of control effort to obtain a collision triangle. We'll get to that answer a little later. Now here's a summary of the geometry for the three cases. The law we originally proposed is in fact proportional navigation. It's a particular form of pronav called pure proportional navigation, but this distinction isn't so important at this time. Usually the navigation gain is between two and five, but it's not necessarily limited to this range. The actual value of the gain can be influenced by many different factors. And if you wanna learn more about this, uh, see Paul Zarkhan's book, Tactical and Strategic Missile Guidance, published by AIAA, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Before proceeding to the problem set, pause the video and be sure you can answer all of the following questions. In the problems, first assume that pursuer velocity magnitude is constant. Determine the PRONAV law in terms of pursuer acceleration instead of the fly path angle rate. So this is going to take a little bit of vector calculus to do this. Just a heads up. And once you've done that, then you have two forms of proportional navigation. They either output the desired fly path angle or the desired acceleration. Now, as I mentioned, the PRONAV law is implemented as part of a feedback loop with the goal of minimizing the missed distance. It's known as the homing loop. And given this idea, consider each PRONAV law implemented as a block in that homing loop. What is the required input data for each PRONAV law? And then second, what type of system would provide that required input data and also, what system would utilize the output of the PRONAV law? In the third problem, let's reflect that we observe three cases of navigation gain, one, three, and five. Considering it takes control effort to change the fly path angle, describe the trend between control effort and the values of n. What is one positive and one negative implication of the higher navigation constant with respect to the pursuer flight control effort? To see more about proportional navigation and an approach similar to that shown in these slides, see Peter Zipfel's book, Modeling and Simulation of Aerospace Vehicle Dynamics.